Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC Service this morning. And today we are going to be looking at a topic called discerning the truth of God's word. It is a very common thing when we ask Christians, why do you believe God's word? And the common answer is people say, I feel it inspires me, or I feel it makes me feel good, or it encourages me to go on in my Christian life, or I feel uh, peace when I read God's word. But there is a fundamental question many of us often forget to address is, firstly, is it true? Are we believing in something that is true or is there any doubt at all as to whether God's word is true? The second issue would be, even if it was true from the beginning, has it been transmitted to us today intact without corruption, without mistakes? And is the message still exactly the same as when it was first written? So we are going to address this issue regarding discerning the truth. Now, discerning the truth has got key words. Words like, how do we prove that it's true? What are the evidence? So if you ask me, what will be a key word today? It will be the word proof. How do we prove that what we have is true? Our verse, scripture for today is found in Romans 12, 2. And we're going to read this verse <coughs> from the NKJV version. Romans 12, 2. As we read the word of God, let the word of God sing into our hearts. And <coughs> if you have opened your Bibles, now... To Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I'd like you to read it together with me. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The ultimate purpose, why we need to avoid conformity to the world, why we need to be transformed by renewing our minds, is ultimately one thing, that we might prove God's will is correct, God's will is true, God's will is good for us, and God's will is embedded in God's word. God's word reveals to us what his will is. Therefore, it matters whether we know that the word of God is true or is it corrupted. Down the ages, from the early beginnings of history, man has always tried to take the Bible apart and try to show that there are mistakes and so on to cast doubt on the Word of God. So today we want to look at how do we prove? There are proofs in everything that God does. God already knew ahead of time what kind of questions we're going to ask and what kind of doubts will arrive in the, arise in the minds of men. So that's why we need to, uh, God has provided answers so that our renewed minds would be filled with the truth. And so, before we go further, let's ask God to give us illumination, to give us light, so that as we listen to this sermon, we'll be able to discern the truth behind God's Word, and not only discern it, but be able to explain it, and be able to defend it, and be able to know what is the basis, why we believe God's Word is true that is inspired uh, by God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you today that you will illuminate the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at. 
and we come against every spirit of unbiblical worldview, everything that exalts itself against our Lord Jesus. We tear them down right now and we want to see out of your word wondrous truths, O oh Father. We ask for your Holy Spirit to open our eyes so that even the wonder of your word will become through very clearly to each one of us. We want to bless every home, every family that is represented so that, Lord, your word will, as it penetrates into the home, Lord, you illuminate every family, every home, that the love of God and the message of your word will come through very clearly. We ask you for your help, Holy Spirit, for our, us to be filled with spiritual understanding. We ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, we know that truth is very important. So we are going to look at the first thing, why do we need to discern the truth? And there are three things I'd like you to remember. Why? The first of all, that all truths must have foundations because fake news abound, whether it be in politics or in every field, whether it be in religious field or even in the field of sciences, there are a lot of fake news all the time. So we need to be able to discern and tell the difference what is true and what is false. And of course, if we know what is true, we can easily identify what is false. And truth must have a foundation. We cannot believe in something without evidence, without proof. And the truth that we trust must have foundation. It must rest on something. So, growing uh, more and more in our world today, fake news is spreading. And one of the ways Satan tries to deceive us is by throwing in a lot of fake news. So, to be able to tell the difference, we must discern. We're going to learn how to do it. Secondly, the re second reason is because unbiblical worldviews also abound in our world today. And their purpose is to squeeze us into its mold, its worldly way of thinking. So this scripture which we have just read says, do not conform to this world. Why? Because the world has a mold and it tries to squeeze us into the mold. In what? In terms of our values, in terms of our thinking, in terms of what the world thinks. The world that is controlled by Satan tries to get us aligned with their thinking so that we will conform to worldly thinking, which are basically material, which are basically based on human wisdom. And uh, there are many things in a worldview, unbiblical worldview, that cannot answer the deepest questions in our hearts. For instance, the biblical worldview explains to us things about eternity, about heaven, about hell, about uh, sin, about the kingdom of darkness and how we could overcome them. But the worldview, which is unbiblical, seeks to tell us that there is no such thing as heaven or there is no such thing as truth, even truth. They don't believe that there can be absolute truth. It's always relative. And so that's the way the world wants to do, squeeze us into its mold. Therefore, we need to combat these worldviews. In fact, in the notes I've given you, we tell us that the young people in our, life, in our world today are besieged with statements coming from educators, musicians, and all these 
high-level educators, even it's well known that in most universities, professors are not only engaged in teaching their field, but because many of them reject the existence of God. Therefore, it is common for professors to try to undermine the truth of the gospel. Colossians tell us that the Colossian Christians understood and received the truth of the gospel. So we need only, not only believe in the gospel, but we need to receive the truth behind the gospel. So the world at large, even among high-level educators, the agenda is to dismantle biblical truth and undermine biblical faith. So this is a danger that our people are facing. And everything they say is rooted in a worldview that is hostile to the faith. And therefore, it could impact the young people, especially as they enter into university. It undermines their faith. It changes their worldviews. And many Christians who are unprepared and have not heard about some of these arguments behind discerning the truth, many have strayed away from the truth because they have no foundation. So discerning the truth helps to avoid being squeezed into the mold that Satan is designed for us. Thirdly, we need to discern the truth because truth is under attack all the time. But now it's being intensified. It's getting worse. Why? Because people who are atheists that are entering into this fray are getting more and more educated in theological schools. So today, people with big degrees from theological schools will come and use their credentials to argue against the authenticity of the Bible. They make use of the doctoral degrees. And uh, many of these people, at one time, when they were very young, have somewhat have a mental agreement or belief in, in the Bible. But as they begin to study more and more, the facts are very clear. But many of them have decided that they will not believe in the truth of the gospel, truth of the word. Because these critics are getting more and more educated, they have got powerful arguments. And because of this, they know how to couch in the language, religious language, that will undermine uh, Christians who uh, may have been untrained and un untutored in this area. For instance, one of the most common phrases that has now surfaced today is a very powerful statement. <clears throat> of course, it's taken out of context. Theologians who are atheists say this, that the number of variants in the New Testament are more than the number of words in the whole New Testament. They are saying that there are many variations. They call them variation, variants. And by this, they imply that there are so many mistakes in the Bible that you cannot trust. And most of them have learned from godly mentors who believe in the inspired word, that the Bible is true. Every word of it is true. The story, the message, the storylines are true. Yes, there are variants because of the language uh, changing with time. It needs to be uh, uh, meaning of words change. So sometimes you need to change the, 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 the vocabulary to bring it up to, 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 uh, to date. Same things. One, the mentor who truly believes based on this evidence. This same man who, who is an atheistic 
uh, theolo theologian were rejected. And the common reason atheistic theologians say is, I want to see the original. Where is the original? I need to know what is written in the original. Everybody knows there's no way you can produce the original that has been written more than 2,000 years ago. But they insist on this argument, which is unreasonable. And they still would decide based on the mindset that they have. What is the mindset that the word of God is untrue. They already decided they are playing God, so the critics are growing more and more. So what will happen? Because of this criticism and uh, couch in a very strong biblical language could undermine the faith of our young people who is untutored. So that's why we need to tell them, what do you mean by variance? What do you mean by the changes? Is it material and so on? So our young people need to be trained to discern the truth of God's word. So three simple reasons. Truth must have foundations because of fake news abounding. Second, unbiblical worldviews are squeezing our people into the mold of the world with their unbiblical worldviews. Third, that the truth is under attack more and more by so-called biblical scholars, but they are atheists who are using the word of God to undermine the faith of believers. So this verse in Romans 12, 2 says that we must learn to prove. To prove is to verify, to look for evidence, to under identify the uh, what is uh, sub, what is behind this truth. So, one of the results of this overall picture is that Satan tries his strategy to recruit ex-Christians to undermine the truth, especially young Christians who have grown up in church, but because they have never learned what the truth is, they become not only a target of Satan to have their faith undermined, but they ultimately also be, become uh, uh, servants of the evil one. So many of those who have written, uh, produce uh, support for for undermining the word of God, um, many of them are clergy, ex-clergy, whether it be Darwin, or even whether it be Dawkins, or whether it be an ex-clergy, uh, 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 Don Cubitt, many of them. Uh, Bart Ehrman, these are some of the recent so-called scholars who have turned from their faith. Secondly, let's learn how we can test the truth. Truth must be tested. To prove something, we need to test it. Even Dr. Luke writing to uh, the, the, his gospel says that there are other writers, but I have personally investigated and I'm giving you an orderly version. So, Luke, Dr. Luke himself investigated to find the truth. So, what would be five things that will help us to test the truth? I call it, how do we prove it? And the first thing we talk about is the presence. The proof it by the whether the writer was present at the time. So it's to be we look at the time. Which period of history was this person? And is he writing 
usually he has to be an eyewitness. There are only two categories. Either eyewitness like the Apostle John when he wrote the second letter to, to uh, called First John, he says, we, we saw him, we handled him, we ate with him, we touched him, and we heard from him. So, John is saying, we were eyewitnesses. Okay. So, majority of the Bible writers were eyewitnesses. Even from the very first, uh, be the beginning, the Genesis. In the Genesis story, who wrote the first three chapters? It was none other than Adam. Because only he and Eve were in existence after the first six days. After the sixth day, he was the only one around. So he recorded and he recorded the words that this is his written account of what happened from the day of creation. So every one of them who recorded these accounts were eyewitnesses. So in Genesis, you'll have not only Adam, you've got Noah, you've got Shem. These are the early, early inhabitants of planet Earth and they recorded it and then passed these written records down to future generations. Now, these are written records. There are many critics of the Bible who say that this is like a telephone game, you know, where, you know, the common game many people play, where one person will whisper to another person a message, and the second person is whispering to the third person the same message. And after the tenth person, when you come back, the mis message is all gobbled, it's changed. But that's what the critics are saying. That that's why the Bible is not reliable. But however, the Bible is a written record. So it's all black and white. Therefore, it is not the same as telling a story, verbally transmitting messages. It's all written in black and white and then transmitted down and copied and transmitted down generation to generation. So the present stairs means this person was there. He's an eyewitness. So you find that Dr. Liu will always uh, would be, uh, he would be considered a investigator. An investigator interviews eyewitnesses, just like a detective. When he goes to a crime scene, he will be looking, uh, looking at the evidences. We call it forensic evidence. Why? Because it's not like so-called scientific. Uh, in honorary science, we say that you can repeat an experiment, so we call it scientific. You can see it again. But when an event is over, if it's a historical event, then the historical proofs must be applied. And Dr. Liu applied the historical proofs by investigating all the eyewitnesses, and then he puts all this account together. Is that acceptable? Well, the courts of laws find this kind of evidence called circumstantial evidence as acceptable provided there is a series uh, combined together. A series of circumstantial evidence is just as powerful as the evidence, we call it direct evidence, which is witnesses. So when, if the if the witnesses have died long ago, then what do we do? There's no, no witness around. But when Paul wrote the account of the resurrection, for instance, he said 500 witnesses, eyewitnesses saw Jesus after the resurrection. And some of them are still alive, he said. 
And I myself, as I record this, I also saw Jesus. So it's always eyewitness accounts. But circumstantial evidence by investigators, experienced investigators, just like a detective going to a crime scene. The murder is over, even if the, all the eyewitnesses have already been dead, yet by piecing a, together the bits and pieces of evidence as found in the crime scene will help the person, uh, the detective, to determine what's the truth. So we call this forensic or indirect evidence or circumstantial evidence. The court of laws, the courts of law accepts it. We call it, uh, these are the kind of historical evidence that we, we have. So, but then practically every book in the Bible that's recorded are either eyewitnesses, the majority are eyewitnesses, people who are present, like the flood. How do we know there was a flood? Well, Noah and his uh, whole family, total eight people, saw the flood. They experienced the flood and they described it. They recorded it and we know exactly when. So, uh, so eyewitnesses are very important. They are present. But also the time, the time at the time of the event. It, eyewitnesses recording the events in the Bible are not people who live thousands of years after. They are sometimes within days. They are sometimes in the event itself and sometimes just soon after. Therefore, the timeline uh, is very important because people who uh, after a long while may have forgotten what is the truth. So the historical records, so the Bible is a historical book, therefore it's full of historical records. And we know that the Bible is true because the people who recorded it tell us they are the eyewitnesses. The first one, Adam. And the last one in the Bible is a person, the Apostle John. So the entire Bible from cover to cover is a record based on uh, the presence of the eyewitness at the event. This makes the Bible the oldest recorded document in the world. And so we know the presence test. Uh, is what every book in the Bible can pass. It can be identified and it will pass. Secondly, <clears throat> how do we test the truth of the Word of God? The evidence is, well, depends on what I call the renewed mindset test. You know, the mindset of a person will tell you what kind of message you will carry. Has he got a special agenda? Has he got ulterior motives? These are depending on what kind of person. For instance, <clears throat> the account in Genesis 1 tells us how God created the heaven and the earth, how he created the moon and the stars. And then we look at the evidence. The evidence, a person who is, have a real new mindset, will be able to receive the evidence. The Bible in Romans uh, tells us in Romans uh, chapter 8 verse 7 says that people whose mind are not renewed, they are, the carnal mind is basically enmity against God. This mind treats God as their enemy not as a friend. It's not neutral. <clears throat> and therefore, they will not be subject to the law of God. So, no matter what evidence you produce, they will not accept it. The renewed mindset test 
is to verify whether this listener or this person who is putting forth his argument is reliable. Take, for instance, Genesis chapter 1 tells us about God's creation of the moon and the stars. <coughs> and scientists clearly found that everything <coughs> has been clearly well designed and that everything is fine-tuned and controlled. But there are people, atheists, who reject this argument, this evidence of design. And so what do they say? People like Richard Dawkins will tell you there is apparent design. But the fact is, was it designed or not designed? Clearly, today there are many uh, scientists, including non-Christian scientists, clearly say that there are, there's a clear-cut <coughs> evidence of design. Everything is fine-tuned from the atmosphere, the oxygen level, to sea level, to uh, tides. Everything is perfectly tuned to such a <coughs> degree that just a slight variation will make planet Earth uninhabitable. But people with a carnal mind will say, I don't think that is fine-tuned. Even though it's clearly fine-tuned, it can be calculated mathematically. It's very, very exact. Everything follows mathematical laws. But they will tell you, I do not accept that there is any fine-tuning or any design at all. So, for people whose mindset is carnal rather than what the Bible calls a renewed mindset, what is a, a, a carnal mindset will not accept the concept of God, no matter what proof. And <clears throat> the Word of God says that our minds need to be renewed all the time because as we learn new things, as th new revelations are given, new evidences are given, a renewed mind is able to grasp the wonder, the significance of God's presence and the accuracy of the Word of God. <coughs> renewed minds <coughs> are very important. Without this mindset, we cannot accept. The Word of God says people will not accept the truth. Uh, so it will be futile to talk to these people because they will always find fault. It, the reason is this. Their, their minds are made up <coughs> and uh, their hearts are hardened. So that will tell us whether they will accept the truth. <coughs> Thirdly, we call it opinated test. Opinated is the opinions of men. Bias. People have their own opinions, but they are based on bias. They are not open to the truth. And when there is bias, the bias test tells us whether this word that was recorded in the Word of God was this man recording to show off. We call it pride. To show his power. So it has got to do with motives. There are three key motives that the Bible talks about. Three biases. There are only three. And <clears throat> pride is one of the most common <clears throat> Are you trying to show off your power, your wisdom, your prestige? Did this writer wrote, write this passage in the Bible to uh, gain monetary gain, to get money? Or is there any 
advantage in gaining pleasure. So we, if you use this test, which detectives always use, they call it, they look for the motive in every crime scene. They look for the motive. Is there any motive at all? Did this murderer murder because there is financial gain or pleasure or power? <coughs> so the same thing applies to the writers of the Word of God, and you'll find that not a single one of them gain personal advantage through this writing. In fact, most of them have to hazard their lives. There was not only no personal advantage to be gained by these writings, but in fact, uh, <clears throat> they may have to pay for it with their own pride, uh, with their lives. John, the apostle of Jesus, recorded, he said, it is written so that you may know the truth and that the truth will set you free. He wrote that it is written that you may believe in the truth that Jesus died for your sins and that you can be saved. So <clears throat> it is just to help us to relate to God. This entire book of the Bible is written so that we'll get to know the writer, the author behind it, God himself. And when we get to know God, it brings assurance in our lives. It brings purpose. It gives direction. It gives wisdom. But the writers themselves did not write for any personal gain. So if we test every writer of the Bible, there are 66 books. Every one of these books are written for a specific purpose, but the purpose is never for any of these three biases, whether it be for personal gain of any kind. And we know that <coughs> they wrote because God instructed them to write and make the records. So we check on bias. And it's easy to find from the writings whether it's bias or not. So this is number three. But number four, it's called verifiable. Is it verifiable? So verifiability, meaning to say, can it be verified? So the verifiable test tells us what are possible alternative ways of corroborating, to countercheck. <coughs> For instance, <coughs> if one person is being interviewed in a crime scene and he gives some evidence, another witness who have also been in a crime scene will give his evidence. We find that these two will not be exactly the same wording but it will give you a story that is complementary. It will not contradict. So one witness evidence can be counterchecked against another witness. So in the Word of God, what are the openings <coughs> available for us to countercheck? Firstly, uh, we can look at the internal writings is to see if there are contradiction. So internal evidence, we won't talk about it. But verifiably test, we will look at outside of the Bible. So for instance, how do we know <coughs> that this uh, events described in the Bible is true? Well, there are many things we can countercheck. We can countercheck from from archaeology, in archaeology digs, they have found uh, engravings on stones. Uh, <coughs> you have heard of this word cuneiforms, or ancient <coughs> uh, records that are being carved into stone. And the Middle East, uh, 
the emperors keep records. They put it on stone uh, carvings. Some uh, have it on papyrus. The Egyptians use it. They write it on papyrus. And lately, they have found out that some of the uh, old papyrus that has been f discovered when they unwrapped it, they found that some of the oldest documents uh, this that describe, say, life in Egypt, for instance, at the time of Moses. So you can compare. But archaeological digs <coughs> are increasing. And archaeologists have found, for instance, the stamps, the seals of emperors described in the Bible, people who are people of authority that is in the Bible, like the prophet Daniel, or King Herod, or Pontius Pilate, they have found some of these seals. And <coughs> so archaeological uh, uh, artifacts help us to verify whether it is true. But by far one of the most common and uh, abundant are what we call historical records. Records written by historians at the time of the Bible. For instance, at the time of the crucifixion, eight scholars, non-Christians, historians, have recorded in their documents. And so uh, <coughs> they are able to verify whether uh, this, for instance, such a person as Jesus, was he crucified? Was he, did he rise from the dead? So these, these uh, scholars have made mention of such a thing. Some, in fact, like one uh, historian, Pliny, wrote about, rather in a negative way, but saying things like Christians who believe in Jesus rising from the dead. So that means that it was common knowledge that Christians have such a claim. So historians <coughs> uh, that supports uh, the records of the Bible, whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, <coughs> uh, they, they, uh, they are in abundance. In fact, one of the key feature about the Bible is that there are, there are what about thousands and thousands of of uh, manuscripts from the ancient past. Year after year, they are finding new, uh, more and more, even older and older documents. <coughs> Take for instance the Old Testament. Uh, <coughs> there was a scholar in the 1850s, a young Christian called Robert Dick Wilson, an American. The more, the, as he grew up as a Christian, he heard a lot of criticism against <coughs> the authenticity of the Bible. People criticize it and say the Bible is untested and untrue. So he was upset because he believed that the Bible is absolutely true. Uh, <clears throat> and he, so he set out to verify it by studying existing documents. So he decided to spend the rest of his life to verify that the Bible is supported by adequate evidence, abundant evidence. So in order to get to the bottom of all the documents available, the, he discovered that there were at least 45 languages in the Middle East that had some kind of translation besides the Hebrew Bible. So 
the first 15 years of his life, he spent it mastering 45 Middle East languages. Enough skill to be able to read the ancient documents, such as uh, in the languages of the Babylonians, the Coptic, Egyptian Coptics, the Ethiopian languages, the Armenian, uh, Syrian, and so on. Uh, all the languages in the Middle East, including Arabic, he was proficient. He gave himself 15 years to master the languages. Then he began to read all these documents in the next 15 years. <coughs> so he carried out research. A brilliant man. He was such a brilliant man that at age 23, he was made a professor of the Old Testament studies. At age 23, he was already an authority of the Bible. <clears throat> so the second 15 years, he carried out research by studying all the manuscripts that he could lay hands on, checking letters he could. You know, the Hebrew Bible uh, has got no vowels by A, O, E. It has only got consonants. He read whatever Hebrew documents he could lay hands on. And then he goes on to the other languages. Because in the early days, the Bible was translated to different languages. For instance, 300 years BC, the Alexandrian Library got it translated with 70 translators, 70 scholars give us a translation into Greek, what was originally a Hebrew version. So by comparing all these different versions, he found that the accuracy of the Bible was incomparable. No other ancient document had so many pieces to compare. And he could, for instance, in this, in Isaiah 53, <clears throat> he found that uh, out of the entire chapter with so many words, there was only one word that was in doubt. But the rest was virtually the same. Now, this is in, 80, in the 1800s, the second half of 1800. So, <clears throat> uh, he did such a good job and he made the conclusion that the entire Old Testament is completely reliable. And he did the, not only the research, he put it all together and he wrote a book <coughs> to explain all this and the detail of his book, <coughs> he called it A Scientific Investigation of the Old Testament. And in this book, he confidently said this, we are scientifically certain that we have substantially the same Old Testament text that was in the possession of Christ and the apostles. And so far as anybody knows, the same as that written by the original composers of the Old Testament documents. In other words, the Old Testament has never been corrupted in any way. <coughs> and uh, this is quite a great amount of work he put in and he, uh, he uh, to compare the, how significantly to put in perspective how accurate the Bible is, Robert Wilson did an experiment. He took a historical record written by a scholar called Ptolemy. Ptolemy was a non-Christian who lived at the time of the Old Testament. <coughs> and he himself, Wilson, used one parameter called uh, examining the name of kings. He chose 
19 kings. And uh, he investigated to see how accurate these 19 kings uh, that, that were not non-Jews, that they were recorded in the uh, 19 hidden kings are recorded in the Bible. So he, what he did was he went around to the different uh, uh, places where these kings were, were reigning uh, in, the, in those early days. And he first of all checked the spelling of the name of the kings. And he found that every name was exactly as recorded in the Bible, spelling and all. Then he checked against the external records like Ptolemy, who also kept a record. And he found that many of his records, the names of the kings were spelled wrongly. A lot of mistakes. And so it's just to illustrate and give him perspective how accurate the Bible is. This is the, the 1800s. <coughs> and uh, Professor Robert Wilson passed away around 1930. And his book and research was being accepted in, uh, to verify the authenticity of the Old Testament. But not only that, in 1948, 18 years after Robert Wilson passed away, they discovered what was called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls were books copied before the time of Jesus. And <clears throat> it was kept in a vase and in, in different va vases and uh, deposited in the caves at Qumrum. When they opened up these ancient scrolls, which are scrolls, of the Bible they discovered. And they found out that as they compare with our modern uh, book of Isaiah as we have today, and he found that it was almost exactly the same. Just as Robert Wilson also discovered using another method, so he verified it. So the Bible is one of the most verified document in the world. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, no other book in the world has got so many manuscripts. And uh, so, and, none, and, uh, the, and no other book has so many historians that also uh, keep some record that we can uh, counter check with. So, <clears throat> in fact, uh, the, the, the Bible can be verified not only from the manuscripts, but they found that because the disciples have got other disciples, they this later on, the later generation of disciples always wrote letters and documents to each other. And they found that when they look at all these letters, they found that the teachings that are being spoken of is exactly the same as what Paul and Peter have written in the New Testament. Okay, so... This is the verifiability test. Now, it's very closely related to this second part, the last one, called evidence. Evidences and verifiability are very closely related, but what are the evidences? <clears throat> evidences of what changes? So, here we are talking about evidence from other documents. This one we are talking about evidence primarily to see whether there were any changes, particularly uh, in the New Testament. Because you have heard 
how Robert Wilson worked on the Old Testament. <coughs> However, the New Testament also uh, has got a lot of uh, a lot of um, manuscripts. <coughs> so. Um, Are there changes? So far, they found that from the manuscripts, there are what is called variants. All right. Now, let me just put down this one. Variants. Well, uh, so you have got statements from people who are who reject the truth of the Bible, says there are so many variants. But the question is, is that a material change? There are variants. Uh, there are many, yes, because with each generation, as the copies are being made, sometimes they do what is called an updating of the vocabulary. Words change in meaning as time goes on. And so sometimes as the manuscripts are being copied, they may update the language. Sometimes there may be a genuine spelling mistake. But because the Bible's message is based on the storylines, rather than the alphabets. Therefore, we found that there is no evidence of material change in the storyline. The changes we are talking about are the kind of change mistakes you may make where all of us text a message to each other uh, and uh, we may have spelling mistakes uh, and uh, for instance, when you text to each other about an appointment to be made at a certain place, uh, at the name of the restaurant, sometimes the spelling of the restaurant's name may be wrong. But we do not have any doubt as to what the message means, even though there may be spelling mistakes. So you can say that Although the copy may not be perfect, there'll be spelling mistakes here and there. But the message we can understand perfectly, even though the copy may have got this kind of uh, mistakes we call variants. In fact, even uh, atheists, uh, who are the theologians, agreed, all of them agreed, that there is no material change in the doctrines or the storylines of the Bible, even though there are variants and spelling mistakes. There is absolutely no change in the doctrines or the storylines. So, in this sense, that there is, we can conclude the, the evidence test for change. There is no material change in any part of the Bible. Therefore, we can trust it wholly. Now, some people find that because they are having doubts about the Bible, they are not reading the Word of God. The best thing is you'll find that even uh, one way is to look for change should be the same storyline can be repeated in different, uh, in different books. For instance, the gospel is repeated by four writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They are written for different purposes. The way the storyline is presented may be slightly different. But there is no contradiction as to the witness. 
Therefore, we say the evidence of changes is uh, virtually non-existent. Now, now that we know these five tests for truth, we can make use of it to verify whether the Word of God is trustworthy. And the answer is that, yes, it is absolutely trustworthy, even though there might be some spelling mistakes along the way when they copied it. It's just a sheer volume of, of, of manuscripts uh, in so many different languages and different times. It is to be expected. Do you think God had, a, had an anticipated this question? long before the Bible is written, that, that whether we have, he, God had anticipated that one day we'll ask a question, is the Bible trustworthy? Now that you know it's trustworthy and how much effort God has put together to ensure that we get the word of God, and what can we do? Perhaps the least we could do is to read it. Meditate on it. Gain wisdom from it. Shall we pray? Take this time to thank God for the fact that He did not give us a book that cannot be verified. And uh, that God has taken so much trouble to make sure that the Word of God we now receive is what it was written in the very beginning. And maybe you want to commit your time, set aside time every day to read the Word of God, to meditate on it, to receive wisdom. Make it a point that in your family altar time, you will put God's Word as something precious, something of great high value. Father, I bless every household today. Let the word of God be something in which that will dwell richly in every heart, in every home, so that, Lord, we will honor your word, we'll study your word, we'll read your word, we'll memorize your word, we'll apply it into our lives, so that, Lord, we will gain wisdom. Put in each one of us, Lord, a new love for your word, a new respect for your word, a new appreciation for your word, so that, Lord, we'll value it because it's from your heart to us. It's about your love for us that we may receive your message with joy. Bless every family, Lord, as every father and mother set aside time for family altar to, 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 to get to know you through your holy word. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.